Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, great pleasure to be here with you all uh, to talk about what is, I think, a very important subject for all of us. Uh, in my particular case, how we deal with social issues. How many of you are following sort of social enterprise courses at Columbia, may I ask, just so I know what type of an audience you are? Okay. And how many of you feel that our society deals well with social issues? Would you raise your hands if you believe that our society deals well with social issues? Not a single person here. <laughs> well, that, that's why I started to get involved in it. And as uh, Bruce mentioned, and Bruce and I met because I spoke at uh, one of your events in London recently, and we described some of the things that uh, we were trying to do, and Bruce thought that it would interest you. And I'm particularly interested in your type of audience, because you come with fresh minds uh, to these types of issues. And as you'll see, what we're trying to do now is uh, to bring about a paradigm shift in the way in which our society deals with social issues. And for many people, social capital markets is an oxymoron or a contradiction in terms because markets are perceived as creating uh, social problems. And so how can you have social capital markets? And I'd like to just give you a little bit of background about how I got involved in it and uh, how I come today to chair a social investment bank with a billion dollars of equity as of a few days ago with a few ifs and buts still along, uh, you know, along uh, the way that needs to be, uh, that need to be resolved. So as uh, Bruce mentioned, at the age of 26, I launched out and created APEX in 1972, co-founded it with other partners. And when I'd been a student at the business school, just as your students here, I was there 67 to 69 at Harvard Business School, something new was in the air. And what was new was entrepreneurship. Because the jobs that everybody wanted to get when I was at the business school were the jobs with the biggest companies. From the UK, there were ICI and Rio Tinto Zinc and you know, these types of companies here in the States. It was GE and General Motors. And entrepreneurship was little thought about, really. And yet, Intel was founded in 1968. While I was at, uh, at Harvard, General Dorio came to speak. Now, General Dory is probably the first venture capitalist. He invested $70,000 in a company called DEC, Digital Equipment. Uh, when it floated, he collected $100 million. That focused me on uh, that type of activity. And so I decided that the next big thing would be entrepreneurship. And uh, it took us a long time to raise our first fund from 72 to 81. Uh, first fund was 10 million pounds, 15 million dollars in, in those days. The latest APAX fund was 11 billion euros, 15 billion dollars or so. And as I've lived through this period of business entrepreneurship, I've become aware, I became aware, that as our society takes an entrepreneurial approach which involves low levels of taxation, high incentives for risk-taking. So the average standard of living goes up, but at the same time, paradoxically, the gap between rich and poor gets bigger and bigger. It doesn't get smaller and smaller, as you might expect. And so when I got a telephone call from the Treasury in uh, 2000, saying, look, we're concerned about poverty. We don't seem to be able to make any real headway in reducing it in the UK. Would you take a more entrepreneurial view of what can be done? Uh, I said yes. And as I worked with a task force of about eight people in 2000, and we published a report which is on the web. It's called the Social Investment Task Force Report. We came out saying, and I'll use a little bit of hindsight in, in describing it now, but we came out saying, look, our society, our capitalist system, deals admirably with its financial and its economic consequences, the current crisis being an example of it. But the system really doesn't deal with social consequences. And so 
as society progresses economically, people are left behind, and they're left permanently behind. What type of equality of opportunity can you give a kid who's at school when both parents are unemployed and have drug habits? You know, what does equality of opportunity really mean, apart from a, apart from a slogan? And yet, this is now giving you a lot of uh, benefit of hindsight, and yet, if you look at our society, between the public sector and the private sector is something that we should call the social sector, traditionally called the voluntary sector or the third sector, we should really call it the social sector, which in the United States has $800 billion of foundation assets uh, in it, and has nearly 10 million people working in not-for-profits in the United States. And in Europe, the figures are similar for the UK. Across the whole of Europe, there are fewer charitable foundations, but 11 million people work in not-for-profits. Okay? And yet, the common characteristic of the sector is what? That virtually no organization has more than three months' worth of capital and they're going cap in hand to raise money all the time. How can you achieve scale? How can you deliver efficiency if you're unable to plan on the growth of your organization? And philanthropy got itself into a mode of thinking that if money goes on overheads, it's misspent. Now, if somebody walked into my office at Apex and said, I want to build a growth firm and uh, I'm not going to spend any money on my organization, I'd show the person the door. How can you do that? And that, that's what we've expected of social organizations. So we came out in 2000 saying a number of different things. The first is, if you can manage to harness entrepreneurship and capital markets and fund social organizations so that they can scale up, develop expertise measure their performance, deliver social impact in a professional way, then you can bring about an order of magnitude change in the way in which our social sector uh, deals with social issues. But in order to sustain social entrepreneurship, just as with business entrepreneurship, you need to create an ecosystem around it. Uh, in the case of venture capital and private equity, where I was lucky enough to get in on the very ground floor, we had to innovate on the types of financial vehicles that we could use. Limited partnerships didn't really exist in Europe before then. And until we managed to get governments to say limited partnerships will be transparent from a tax point of view, each one of us was setting up a different cockamamie structure involving Bermuda and the Jersey Islands and all the rest of it so that investors wouldn't be taxed unfairly on the way if they were tax-free investors like, uh, like uh, pension funds. Uh, you needed to get institutions to make an allocation to private equity and venture capital. Otherwise, you were going to somebody who was responsible for investment in public stocks and saying, hey, why don't you put some money in my fund? And person would say, well, I'm sorry, I don't have a, an allocation for, uh, for that. Stock exchanges to float the companies off. Who was going to invest in a, in a young company that was going to make losses for a number of years if the risk was that you would run out of money and couldn't really fund the next stage of growth, even if the product was a very promising one? The role of NASDAQ, which was founded in 1970, was absolutely crucial in the development of the U.S., uh, venture capital industry, and private equity industry, but venture capital more so. Similarly, in, in Europe, we created ESDAC. It's, it's another story that we can talk about to try and play the same role, and then a number of different countries emulated it. So you needed to create not just an ecosystem in the sense of values, but an ecosystem in the sense of institutions that supported business entrepreneurship. And we said to the government, you need to provide tax incentives for investment in poorer areas. You need to get charity regulation to change so that charities could do what is now called program-related uh, investment. 
Uh, we can go into that if you're, you're interested. This is uh, investments which uh, will yield some financial return, but not a market rate of return, but are consonant with the objectives of your charitable organization. So it's related to your charitable program. Uh, and that was an innovation which uh, started here in, uh, in the United States. We wanted to bring the same thing over to uh, Europe. We're now doing the same with social investment. We've now defined a new category, which we call <laughs> mixed motive investment. And it says, even if it's not related to your program, if you think it's a worthwhile social objective, you can invest in social impact bonds or you can invest in social investment funds of different kinds. Uh, if you are a trustee of a, of a foundation. And we said to the government, you ought to provide incentives for the creation of venture funds that invest in the poorest parts of the country because basically or education boundaries, but capital doesn't go into poorer areas. And poor areas are basically, from an economic point of view, under-invested areas. And uh, finally, uh, that the banks ought to disclose what they do. Uh, we don't have uh, the, the Community Reinvestment Act legislation in Europe, and the banks have been rather loath on the whole to disclose what lending they're making to poorer areas. And finally, we said you need to create, support the creation of a body to represent the industry which we created. Following the task force report in 2002 with a person called Michelle Giddens who had worked at Shawbank previously and had been my uh, assistant on uh, the task force, we founded Bridges Ventures to test the proposition that you could make returns if investing in poorer areas that were sufficiently attractive to bring capital in. Now you have to realize that up until then, in the United States, for instance, with the New York City Venture Fund, funds had taken a double bottom line, as they called it. They had uh, satisfied themselves with a combination of social and financial returns. And I was struck by something the manager of the New York Fund said to me. She said to me, you know, when we try to achieve a social objective, we achieve it. When we try to achieve a financial objective, we achieve it. But when we try to do both, we fail. And a light bulb went on in my mind coming out of the private equity industry. And we founded Bridges on the principle that the role of the team was to maximize the return on investment by investing only in the poorest 25% of Britain. So all of a sudden, you had a team, it had management fee, it had carry, we raised the first fund of 40 million pounds, and we said to investors, we are going to try to deliver half a venture return, which in those days was 10 to 12% in our view. Today it looks pretty good, but, uh, <laughs> uh, well, what happened? We've, we're delivering 17.5% net IRR. There is a layer of subordinated debt in it. But what have we discovered? We've discovered that uh, a single mother of three who left school at 16 uh, with no uh, qualifications to speak of, academic qualifications, with her business partner could turn £300,000 into £22 million in the space of three years. We discovered that uh, you could define business models that work in poorer areas which are much more effective at using capital and much more price sensitive. So one example for those of you who uh, go to London would be the Hoxton Hotel, which is located in Shoreditch, now becoming a hip uh, part of London, partly as a result of the Hoxton. But the rooms are the size of a ship cabin. There are no, there are no facilities apart from a franchise restaurant variable cost, variable uh, pricing, like uh, EasyJet. Uh, the weekend you could stay for five pounds if there's no demand. 98% occupancy, many times our investment. Uh, or the gym, uh, which are big gyms, 15,000 square feet, open 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, located in the poorest areas of the country, 19 pounds, 
membership a month when the average in the UK is 50 or, or 60 uh, pounds. Uh, we're now signing up 6,000 people in these, in these areas before the gym opens, and 40% of people have never used the gym. So you begin to discover that actually there are business models that are highly effective. And Bridges today manages 250 million pounds. Some of the money, as Bruce was saying, is in a social entrepreneur's fund, which is different from the venture activity I've just been describing. These are funds where we're backing not-for-profits that want to scale up, uh, can only deliver a 5% rate of return, but are capable of achieving sufficient revenues to be sustainable. We also have property funds, investing in properties located in the poorest uh, 25% of Britain. And that experience of Bridges and the quality of the team was one of the milestones in beginning to persuade the government that, look, social and financial returns are not mutually exclusive. They're not mutually exclusive. We haven't really thought about this sufficiently. And there are new approaches and innovation uh, which is required if we're going to deal with social issues properly. Fast forward um, a few years, and in the 2000 report, we said financial returns attract capital. You can see it in the private equity industry. Social returns don't attract capital. So if you're going to have an efficient structure to fund social organizations, you're going to need a social investment bank. And it'll need to be of considerable size because the size of the issues is, is so significant. And we recommend that it be a wholesaler of capital. It doesn't try to be the hub of the social sector with everybody dependent on it. It's responsible for developing a number of suppliers of capital. Okay? And in 2005, as Bruce was saying, I began to focus on unclaimed assets because the government entered into negotiations with banks and said to them, look, you're holding on to money which isn't yours. People who have forgotten about their account and you can't find them, people who've died and left the money and there's no estate to, you know, to collect the money, that money is with you. And the government said to them, we'd like to take that money away from you and use it for social causes. Two people from the social sector came to me and said, look, will you chair a commission to see what we can do with this money? And the commission called the Commission on Unclaimed Assets, came out recommending to the government that £250 million of the estimated £400 million in British banks, which is in accounts that have been lost, unclaimed, for 15 years or more, 250 should be provided as equity to create a social investment bank which could then focus on developing the social sector. And legislation was passed in the UK in 2008, but the then Labour government, despite the fact that I was a, a supporter of it, a financial supporter as well as a moral supporter of it, said to me, you know what, you want to 50, we think we can give you 75. So I said, you can't do anything with 75. And with two or three friends from the financial sector, David Blood, who'd been at uh, Goldman Sachs Asset Management, and uh, Stanley Fink, now Lord Fink, who founded really the hedge fund industry in, in uh, the UK, and with a philanthropic family like your family, uh, we put together a couple of million pounds of philanthropic money, and we started to recruit a team for an organization called Social Finance. And there's now social finance, as of a year ago, uh, social finance US, based in Boston. But social finance UK went from one person to 30 people over three years. And I wanted to prove that if you focused with the same intensity on social issues and connecting social entrepreneurs to the capital markets, you would innovate very significantly. And we did. 
and it represented another important milestone to the setting up of the Social Investment Bank. And this team, which went from 1 to 30, in September of the year before last, developed and implemented the first social impact bond. How many of you are aware of it? I doubt that any of you, a few of you are. Okay, great. Well, the way the social impact bond works is this. We went to the government and we said, we have a major problem with young prisoners, two-thirds of whom, if they've been incarcerated before the age of 21, reoffend within one year of release. This is true in the States, it's true in Europe, it's true everywhere. We will raise $8 million to fund three not-for-profits that work with the prisoners around Peterborough Jail, which is close to Cambridge University, but there's no academic connection between the two. And we will have skills in-house in recidivism, in preventing recidivism. Uh, and if we don't achieve over six to eight years a reduction in the rate of reoffending of 7.5% or more, the money will be lost. However, if we are successful in reducing the rate of reoffending relative to the rest of the country, there's a control group of 10,000 prisoners, similar age, demographics, and so on and so forth, by 75 to 15%, then the government will pay back the bond, the $8 million, and will pay a floating yield that will go from 2.5%, just above 7.5% reduction, to 13% if we hit a 15% reduction. And according to our estimations, government would only be paying out one-third of the saving. Now, gentlemen, I was talking to uh, yesterday at the Ford Foundation when I described this to him said to me, you're securitizing social outcomes. For the first time, in other words, you can have a read across from a social performance, which could be an improvement in the dropout rate, <coughs> it can be an improvement in homelessness, it can be uh, an improvement in treatment at home instead of treatment in hospital, it can be an improvement in the rate of drug rehabilitation, it can be an improvement in the rate at which uh, people are getting into the workforce instead of going into unemployment. Wherever you've got metrics, you can achieve a social performance which links to a financial return. And it's different from having a government contract which is somehow performance-based. Because here you have a security which has paid out 7 or 10 percent. And so for the first time, a social entrepreneur could raise capital in the same way that a business entrepreneur could raise capital, could have a growth path for a social organization and say, hey, I know how to deal with homelessness. I paid 10% on my bond last time. Will you give me more money so that I can manage to extend my activities elsewhere in, in the country? And it's preventative. Instead of dealing with the consequences of social issues, for the first time, if government is prepared to pay out on the basis of social performance, you can actually prevent people from reoffending instead of constantly building jail cells. There are, what, six million people in the United States within the criminal system in jail cells or in, in detention. Unbelievable social cost. Uh, you know, anyway, we don't need to go into uh, the emotional details of people who have forgotten in isolation for years. Uh, the example we saw... Uh, in the press uh, the other day. In any event, the arrival of the social impact bond in the UK persuaded the Conservative government, the Conservative coalition, to turn to us and to say, look, will you advise us on setting up, uh, us being uh, Nick O'Donoghue, uh, who's a Wharton Business School graduate, uh, 12 years Goldman Sachs, 12 years J.P. Morgan, uh, who left in order to devote his time to uh, social issues, aged 50 and made money and would like to do something for society in his turn, led us to put forward a plan to the government 
which was based on an offer from the government that we should get all of the unclaimed assets. So the government said to us, basically, if you put up a, an acceptable plan, you can have £400 million, pounds, $600 million of equity. And the government said, we've talked to the banks, and we think the banks would be prepared to put up, the main four banks in the UK, £200 million, pounds, £50 million pounds each, in the way of loans, which we, in negotiation with the banks, have turned into a strategic partnership involving an investment of equity. So as of three, four days ago, we now have potentially £600 million of equity for a social investment bank, which is an investment, a, a capital wholesaler for the social sector, whose objective is to ensure that the social sector is better funded than it was in the past and could move the needle on social issues. But just as with business entrepreneurship, the impact was not just employment by entrepreneurial firms. It wasn't just the employees in Dell and Google, and, well, Google was later Dell and Microsoft and Apple in the early years that brought the real impact of entrepreneurship, was it? It was the change in mindset that entrepreneurship brought to government about its attitude vis-a-vis -vis of growth in the economy and employment, to investors who had previously wanted to invest only in shorter-term public securities and now began to say, you know what, change of mindset, we'll have an allocation for private equity. In the minds of executives of companies who previously prized job security and all of a sudden began to think of taking risk and, and, and making capital. And I believe that social investment can move the needle on the way in which government, big corporations and investors support the activities of the social sector. I think it can bring a paradigm shift in the way in which foundations function. One of the interesting things about the social impact bond is how many of the organizations that invested, we only went to foundations. 17 foundations invested in an $8 million bond. How many do you think kept it on their balance sheet as an investment? And how many do you think viewed it as a grant out of the annual allocation? Any guesses? Or maybe somebody knows. Who would like to give me an answer? How many kept it on their balance sheet rather than just taking it out of their grant allocation for the year? Yeah. Sorry? Zero? Five percent? Sorry, five out of a third? Any other guesses? All of them? Okay, we're getting closer. <laughs> we, uh, three quarters, two thirds of them kept it on their balance sheet. Now that told us something. That told us that <coughs> foundations were prepared to use their balance sheets, not just their grant allocation. That told us there's $700 billion, potentially, a portion of which could go into social investment vehicles of different kinds. If you can deliver today on a social impact bond, 7 to 9%, uncorrelated to capital markets, and achieve a social outcome that improves people's lives and cohesion in society and quality of other people's lives, that's pretty good investment, isn't it? Especially as it's uncorrelated. And so, I'll shift to questions very soon, but you begin to see how the role of big society capital, which I chair until it's fully operational, Nick O'Donoghue uh, is the CEO, how big society capital can begin to define a strategy to get the social sector properly funded. We had to deliver a business plan to the government before the government released the funds. The business plan 
put forward the vision that, look, Bridges Ventures, there should be six Bridges Ventures or more in the UK, let alone in, you know, in the United States. Social entrepreneurs funds which back ambitious social entrepreneurs who want to create scalable social organizations but can only deliver a 5% return or so, there should probably be a dozen funds like that. Venture philanthropists who are basically raising donations in order to sit on the boards of not-for-profits and help them should really have pools of capital like that, that they're responsible for investing on a discretionary, on a discretionary basis. Social impact bonds should be funded through funds. Why wouldn't you have a social investment fund that can invest in social income bo uh, bonds, other forms of outcome capital, social venture funds, social entrepreneurs funds? Why wouldn't that give a foundation, a diversified portfolio in the investment area? And wouldn't that bring you to define in due course, products for pension funds, where the first 10 or 20% of the downside risk is insured, so that the fiduciary responsibility is taken, is taken care of. The aim is to turn social investment into an asset class. To do for social entrepreneurship what we were lucky enough to be able to do for business entrepreneurship. And with that, I'll be delighted to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Please. To what extent do you see that your business model can be replicated elsewhere in Europe? Uh, it's very interesting that uh, the EU organized the Social Entrepreneurs' Day in Brussels about two months ago. 800 people turned up from across Europe. At lunch, I was seated next to the head of the Department of Employment of the EU. He said to me, you know, I think these social impact bonds qualify for our social fund. Great, I said, how much is in the social fund? He said, 13 billion. <laughs> 13 billion euros. So it's not the access to capital that's going to be the problem, in my view. We will be able to identify sources of capital. Just as with business entrepreneurship, the constraint is going to be social entrepreneurs who know how to deal with social issues, have the management skills and the vision to scale up, develop a model that really delivers results. And I don't know whether in that area we're going to find the same thing that we found in business entrepreneurship, which is that it takes quite a lot of time uh, for continental Europe to cotton on to these ideas. And so the UK may make the pace for a while. But I have hope that because business entrepreneurship has been around for, you know, 30 years now, we may find that with social entrepreneurship it goes faster. And the whole social market philosophy of Germany and France may also help us uh, to attract entrepreneurs in these areas. It may actually become creditable for people to become more creditable to become um, social entrepreneurs than business entrepreneurs. So I don't know is the answer, but I do think it's extensible. Uh, I've spent time in Australia. Australia has already allocated $25 million to two social impact bond pilots. In the UK, there are about 10 pilots. The Obama administration uh, set aside $100 million for pay-for-performance bonds, as uh, they called them here. So the budget hasn't been passed, but at the federal level, that money would be available. And we created Social Finance USA, as I was mentioning, uh, to introduce social impact bonds and outcome capital here. And we're working with the government of Massachusetts and with Connecticut and, uh, and uh, New Jersey. And we hope uh, that $100 million of social impact bonds can be issued in the United States this year. We're certainly working, working hard on that. I think it's a global movement. I mean, it's, ama it's amazing in Australia how quickly 
people have gotten on to it. Canada had a task force. Uh, Ex-Prime Minister Paul Martin sat on it. Uh, they want to try and uh, do something which we're trying to do in the United States, which is to define a pension fund regulation so that pension funds can invest their fiduciary responsibility would be taken care of even if the returns are a bit below market because it's consistent with their social objectives. And it's crucial that it be a global movement. The reason I'm interested in speaking to all of you today is each of you is potentially a leader in making change. And it needs to happen everywhere uh, because it provides reinforcement. I hope that the creation of big society capital in the UK will lead the United States to set up a social investment bank with a billion dollars of, of equity. Um, so we'd like, you know, we'd like to try to move this forward. McKinsey is doing a big study at the moment of uh, the scope for social impact bonds. Um, I hope they'll deal with the sectors also that they would be particularly appropriate for. Um, if you can manage to get international organizations like that, you know, to analyze it and report on it and uh, so on, it will obviously ease its uh, introduction. Please. Um, thank you for sharing. I think I'm really excited to hear about the work that's happening and the actual returns that are so high. Um, wanted to just take an approach of devil's advocate. What is your response to um, someone saying, you know, Investing should be just where the highest returns are, and these social issues are actually more a policy issue, and that the fact that we have this inequality, it actually just should be political like policy regulation and better regulation of the financial system, and it shouldn't be that we are looking for investing in these types of areas, and that the best allocation of capital is actually investors looking for the highest return. So from that perspective, how do you feel about, you know, is it just a sense of, well, policy's not doing it, so we have to do it, or is this a better way? I think that uh, the notion that in a foundation whose purpose is charitable, you should have a clean division between making money out of your investments and giving money away in grants is just ridiculous. I think it arose, it arose at, in days when charity was the only way of helping the poor. And legislation made it such that you could only give money to the poor if they remained poor. That, that, that's the way it was defined. Like one of the issues we had in the Social Investment Task Force when we were talking about making regulations clearer, if you gave a ladder to an unemployed person so the person could become a window washer, was that a charitable, a charitable gift? Economic development wasn't included within it. Now, charity started in, at the end of the, I mean, foundation started at the end of the 19th century. And charity has gone a very long way. Today, you have to redefine it as the most junior tranche of equity. It's the risk capital of social organizations. Because people don't want charity, they want a chance, basically. And it's a completely different approach. And so I think you need to be a little more versatile in the use of the assets that you have. If your aim is to achieve a social objective and you can achieve the objective better by using your balance sheet as well as your, you know, the returns from your investments, obviously it makes sense to do it. Now as to the issue of government, it's not that government hasn't tried. Government's got dragged into dealing with social issues. For decades has spent trillions on dealing with these social issues, and not a single one of you put up their hand when I asked the question, have we done a good job of dealing with social issues? So it's not the government's failed completely. Government's certainly done some good, but government isn't really equipped to do it. In the same way that when I was your age and the government in Britain wanted to try and boost the motor industry, government decided to bring about a consolidation of the motor industry and put together companies, and they failed. If you look at entrepreneurship as a way of creating jobs, it's been a lot more successful than government intervention in trying to you know, create jobs by saving industries. And so I think the definition of the role of government is going to change. Government is going to become more an enabler. If you have models that are established, government may adopt them. I mean, if the Peterborough 
uh, project proves that there are much better ways of dealing with people who are released from jail, government may say, you know what, we'll do it ourselves. We'll move on to the next social issue. So we're not, this is not a sort of ideological uh, discussion about the role of government. It's a discussion about if government has not managed to deliver the results, shouldn't we give entrepreneurs and capital markets a chance? And people from, you know, from your generation, if I can uh, put it that way, I think understand rather better than perhaps my generation understood it also, because I'm a 60s kid, so it was all you know, ide you know, idealism and so on and so forth. But the generations that came after were much more materialistic, much more introverted. And I think we're all beginning to realize this is not going to work. You know, social cohesion is something that we have to worry about. Apart from the moral imperative of trying to help people who are suffering, and in the enlightened interest of, uh, you know, of the population at large, we have to deal with these issues more effectively. So I think the change of mindset goes away from saying only government can do it to saying let's give entrepreneurs a chance, from saying only charity will do it to saying let's be cleverer about using capital to achieve this. And if in the process we develop a spectrum that goes from pure philanthropy to the bridges like locomotive is the is the financial return and the carriages are the social benefits, so be it. And there'll be different stations all along that spectrum with different investors interested in funding it. If you look at what um, microfinance has done, in the space of 20, 30 years, it's got to $40 billion. How many of you think that outcome capital, like social, inc you know, social impact bonds, uh, to, could get to that sort of sum. You know, that's probably a third of you. The minority is always right. <laughs> Can you talk a little more about um, the impact of the community? So you're saying you were looking at the poorest areas going into these areas. Can you talk a little more about how the community has grown and benefited specifically? Right. So... If you look at the website of Bridges Ventures, you will see that they have a description of financial returns and a description of social returns. And there are metrics for social returns. And each portfolio company that Bridges invests in is bound by contract to track these metrics. So in the case of Bridges, it'll be how many people are employed who came out of unemployment, uh, how much of the purchases that the company makes are from the local area in which they have in invested, uh, how much of the sales of the particular company are within the area, what's the multiplier of capital uh, that has been attracted by the Bridges, by the Bridges money. In the case of something like the Peterborough bond, obviously uh, every prisoner who is released and stays in a job for a year or for two years or for, you know, for three years is another social metric that is quantifiable. But there are also uh, prospects for foundations to say, we're prepared to pay out on a social impact bond, instead of the government paying out, the foundation will pay out, on the basis of a social scorecard. So we may not be 100% sure about the, drop in, uh, about the drop in the dropout rate, ninth grade dropout rate. I was at the Jay-Z concert yesterday, you'll be pleased to know. <laughs> and, and, and they had great concerts. And, <laughs> and they had a figure that in New York City, 39% of kids drop out in ninth grade, right? Now, kids move, it's difficult to track everything, but it could be that a foundation is prepared to take a more holistic view, less quantitative view, of the metrics that are required to be achieved in order to, in order to pay out. 
Now, at a local level, there's a major challenge because the sorts of things I've been talking about are very much top-down. But when you're dealing with local organizations that are helping the vulnerable in the vicinity of the people that are, you know, that are running these organizations, the sums are small, the size of the organizations are small, and so on. So there we're trying to develop platforms, electronic platforms, that match donors and recipients or investors and investees. So that if you live in Wolverhampton in the UK and you want money for your small business or you want money for your you know, homeless organization or whatever else you're involved with, there's actually uh, a guidepost that gets you to uh, the person that can invest in you. Returns and financial returns are not mutually exclusive. It's something that hit me back in university, and so it's great to see it at this level. Um, one of the challenges that I've seen in um, in this paradigm shift is, or trying to motivate this paradigm shift, is I, I'm from Nigeria, and I've been working in Nigeria for the last three years, and uh, the the issue is getting people in the Western world to see developing countries in Africa, in Latin America, or Southeast Asia as opportunities and market growth opportunities as right. opposed to aid areas or if I go and do business in there, it's my corporate social governance or corporate social responsibility and so on. Right. So um, what do you see on, on a top level, where do you see businesses um, in terms of how, how they can shift their view of expanding into these areas and creating because, you know, like you said, it's more um, economic empowerment as opposed to aid. Yep. Um, so where do you see that shift? And then even on, on a people level, how would you, what are your recommendations for sort of motivating others to see, to do it. To see it that way as well? Uh, now, I don't know very much about uh, Africa, but my partner Alan Patrikoff has spent a lot of time in places like Nigeria. And his view is that we haven't reached the stage where there's sufficient equity capital in the, available in those economies. And really the first stage is to create venture funds. And somehow we've got to be able to attract that sort of capital. So before you start thinking social issues, you've got to start thinking economic empowerment. I don't know how you bring that about. I know how you might be able to deal with issues of illiteracy because the social impact bond would be a perfect vehicle for that because the metric is very clear and there are attempts now to try to create a global fund to invest in education but how much more powerful would that be if it was performance based like a social impact bond? And some investors put the money up and international organizations were going to pay out on, on results. Uh, so I can, see, I can see how in Africa you can tackle some very basic social issues. But it isn't the fundamental issue. The fundamental issue, as you correctly say, seems to be economic empowerment, giving people the opportunity to create uh, jobs that can sustain them. And I don't know how you, I don't know how you bring that about. Maybe, maybe it has to come from within Africa. You know, I mean, there are so many people now in places like Nigeria who've been educated, like yourself, uh, you know, who, who could go back and actually begin to make a difference and create role models. But I don't know how you get it going, although I must say that there is a lot greater awareness now among social entrepreneurs. I mean, there are people like, we were talking about the Acumen Fund, for instance, um, Jackie Novogratz's fund uh, that focus solely on uh, Africa. Uh, so there are a few examples, but maybe you should lead the effort. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <right>. <laughs> 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 
Now, my, my experience in life is if you see something which should happen, then go to it and make it happen. Please. Um, having a billion dollars in equity at a social investment bank is pretty incredible. And it all sounds pretty complicated. And um, it, like how, do you, how do you get governments and institutions and um, you know, uh, foundations and stuff to agree on a price for social issues, agree on one price that they're all going to buy that bond for or whatever. It seems like that's actually Great question. Price. So how, how do you bring those institutions together? Great and question. It's complicated, I imagine, must be. Yeah. Uh, 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 several uh, levels of answer to your question. In launching the first social impact bond, I was very much involved in the negotiations with the British government. We tried to set it at a price that would attract investors. And if you were going to have a cliff below 7.5% reduction, you were going to lose your money. You know, we talked to investors, and they said, if you give us 75 to 13%, we'll put the money up. The market will become more competitive. And as you begin to realize that there's actually a balance sheet for a social organization, and there are other forms of outcome capital, which, uh, for instance, uh, in the case of Hackney Community Transport, you have this bond which uh, has a yield dependent on the increase in sales of an organization which is providing transport to the community under government contracts, and it's pay, it'll pay 5 or 6%. So social impact bonds may not end up being at 9 or 10% because it's a, a social impact bond um, in coming out of a pool would be a diversified pool. You'd expect it to yield less than a security which is dependent on a single organization. So you're beginning to see where different tranches should be priced relative to each other. Where they actually end up being priced, I think, will depend on the appetites of investors and what turns out to be a good deal. Had we discovered that if we paid out 13%, government would only hold on to a third of the saving, it wouldn't have worked. So the quantification of the saving is an important element of the pricing. You are securitizing outcomes, but your yield is dependent on the savings you're achieving for government. Now, second level of answer to your question. It turns out that at Washington State, there's a guy called Steve Aos. I met him in Downing Street. The government organized a meeting, invited Steve Aos. Steve Aos has done for, Washington, for the Washington State Legislature the following thing. For every social issue, homelessness, drugs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, he's, he's quantified the social cost. And he's also quantified the cost of an intervention to cure it. Okay? So it costs you, you $100,000 a year to have a homeless person. It will cost you $20,000 to get that person into a home, into a job, and so on and so forth. Therefore, the IRR is 30%, you know? And I think we're going to drive towards that. I think that, you know, when you've got sufficient organizations around that you can begin to say the benchmark for homelessness is 20,000 bucks. It's not 100,000 bucks per person. It's 20,000 bucks because such and such an organization in Boston's doing it, and there's another one in Kentucky that's doing something similar. So you begin to get market, market pricing. Do you have one, one central body at the end of the day? No, I think the market, the, the central body is the invisible hand, the invisible hand of the market, because when you go to issues, so we've got now a, a billion dollars, okay, 600 million pounds. We will want to support social impact bond issues how we prepare to support them. We're prepared to underwrite them. So if uh, an organization in the UK comes and says, I want to issue a bond for homelessness, uh, will, you, you know, will you raise it for me? Well, the first thing we will say to them is you have to go to an intermediary. You have to go to Social Finance UK. We can do the underwriting, but they have to set the terms. Social Finance UK will trawl around their investors, say, Here's the, you know, he here is the issue. How many of you are prepared to invest in it? We think we can achieve the following savings. Government will sign a contract. We can afford to pay you so much. You get to a price. They then come to us, and they say to us, look, we've trawled institutions, but you know, we want to be able to underwrite this. We want to be sure we're going to get the money. 
we're going to have to take a view about whether or not it's feasible to place that bond. The minute we take a view and underwrite it, it'll set a benchmark in the market. So in a way, the social investment bank becomes the price setter because it's providing the underwriting capability and so on. I have a couple of other ideas in, you know, in gestation which may, may actually lead to pools of capital being raised with tax incentives included, right? So, for instance, today, under CRA legislation, you, you, get, a, you, know, you get a tax break, new markets um, uh, tax credit, you get a tax break. That may actually reduce the cost of capital uh, for, you know, for certain social impact bond issues. So in the UK, there is an attempt by Social Finance UK to launch a vehicle on the stock exchange. We're creating, we're, we're supporting people who want to create a social stock exchange. So it would be quoted on the main market and on this social stock exchange, okay? Which basically benefits from a tax incentive which exists for investment in small businesses. And if the government extended it to that, then you get the equivalent of new markets tax credit, which is you can deduct from your tax bill, not from your income, 5% a year of the amount of your investment for each of five years. So you're getting, if you gross it up for the rate of tax, you're getting a 40% tax break, like a philanthropic donation. And yet you hold on to the capital, you don't pay capital gains tax on it, and you don't pay a state duty if it passes to your, uh, it passes to your heirs. So we're going to try and keep the cost of capital as low as we possibly can, and we will find that there is a, a tiering in the sector. So just as, uh, you know, with uh, subprime mortgages, but hopefully more successfully, uh, the market will set a price. I think everything will go. Uh, we called it a social impact bond. But, of course, it's a hybrid security because on the downside, it's equity. There's nothing to protect your downside. On the upside, it behaves like a bond because it has a capped return. So you can argue about whether it's, you know, whether it's equity or debt. But from a marketing point of view, the concept of a social bond um, was attractive, and so we, we stuck with social impact bond. But I think you will need equity primarily in this area. Most of the, of the money will, will not be protected on the downside. It could be that um, we could ensure through big society capital the first 10% of loss or 20% of loss to make it acceptable for pension funds. But if you put a government guarantee underneath it, you haven't really achieved anything. So I think it's going to be equity-like. And then perhaps for the senior tranches, uh, you could issue bonds which are like normal bonds but benefit from a, a tax incentive um, you know, of some kind. But it's too, you know, it's too early to know. But it's going to be a lot of risk capital. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if they can't really track the money, market finance has a lot of yeah. around that. What kind of controversies do you foresee? What kind of right. and how would you respond to those? Excellent question. Now the reason we only went to charitable foundations with the first social impact bond is exactly that. Because I didn't want people to say they're gonna make money off twenty one year old prisoners who are released oh, from yeah. jail, you know. Over time, as you know, it becomes uh, worthy to invest in social investment uh, vehicles, um, you know, I think you'll be able to go to other types of investors. And, you know, we're trying to do that. We're trying to do that already. It could be controversial, but I think, it, you know, just as uh, private equity uh, and 
you know, is becoming controversial now because it's delivering returns, but the, you know, the returns are too high, and some people are accused of asset stripping. On the whole, private equity does a very good job of keeping the growth rate uh, in, you know, in the economy up. Um, it may become controversial. So it is a major challenge. We have to think carefully about how we do it, particularly as I think this is an area that ought to provide rehabilitation to those who are earning extremely high salaries in some way, because it makes more sense than traditional charity. But how, how do you protect them uh, from the accusation that, look, they're only doing this uh, because they want to enrich themselves? So probably by having low returns is the answer. Having a social return which compensates for uh, uh, a discount to a market return. Important issue. There's somebody right behind you, I think, who wants to. Yeah. Sure. 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 So I think it'll end up being a combination of both. Uh, I would like to think that investment management organizations would decide to launch social investment funds because it's quite easy to manage. But we need to develop expertise in dealing with social issues as well. And so we, we need to create an industry of equity investment in social organizations. Social venture funds need to become a sector. So that if somebody walks in and says, I need help, I think there's a way for me to feed the hungry through remaindered goods from supermarket shelves and I want to do it in this way, or I, I want to develop a model for homelessness which involves uh, building uh, new housing putting the homeless in them, training them to go into jobs. When in jobs, they will begin to pay rent. I'll use the rent to borrow to create the next one. People come with business models of this kind. You can devote enough time to analyze it properly and put money in and then help with management skill to make it happen. So I don't think it can all be just additive to existing organizations, but I'm sure the banks will be very interested in distributing these types of products. And funds of funds will be easy for financial organizations to organize. So a fund that invests in social impact bonds, for instance, could be run by a major bank, just as has happened with microfinance. I think the focus is on identifying entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, who can really improve people's lives and helping them to achieve it. And I think that needs to be done by specialist organizations. Just as if you want to invest in the internet today, you're not going to give it to your, you know, to your local bank to manage. You're going to go to one of the specialist funds. Yeah. Having worked with a number of social venture funds and on various parts of the, the return spectrum, I, I almost felt that we had a harder time finding the, the deals, the, the right entrepreneurs, as you mentioned, yep. and getting access to capital. And now with almost a billion dollars under management, yep. how do you think that Right. Deals and not just go for s bigger deals to reduce the transaction cost, but to actually you know, generate impact right. at the right levels. So this is the question of the chicken and the egg. And I, I say in my, I shouldn't quote your own book, but the, the chicken and the egg came at the same time. And if you think about it, they did. And here, I can give you a concrete example when we started to talk of these sums for the big society bank, all the trade press of the social sector says there are no deals. What are you talking about? You know, hundreds of millions. But I've lived through this through private equity. Uh, so I said, you know, and I, I used to say this in venture capital, there's Say's Law. Say's was a French economist of uh, the late 19th century. Say's Law is the supply of money creates its own demand. Okay. Now, the minute we started to say that we were investing, which was in July of last year, we started to get deal flow. I'm carrying in my briefcase 70 requests for funding. We've made eight investments so far. 
The first investment was to the Private Equity Foundation, which is a charitable foundation which has probably $20 million within it, has been focusing on youth employment. And they said, we want to raise a social impact bond to help youth. Subsequently to that, I had a conversation with the head of the foundation. I said, well, what do you want to do with this? Do you want to turn it into an advisory company, an investment management organization? I said, no, investment management organization. That's what we want to do. And so you begin, once people know they can get hold of the money, you begin to attract people who think the chances of success have become more reasonable. In the early years of Apex, we had to go out and craft our own investments. Now, I pride myself on having achieved 30% net IRR for 15 years. But my first investment in 1981 was in a machine that mopped up water from tennis courts and cricket pitches. Can you believe it? I had an inventor who walked in. I brought the guy who ran Hertz rent a car. I put the two together, put in a quarter of a million pounds, and tried to make a go of this thing. We then discovered that every time any club wanted to buy a machine, because none of the clubs had money, they had to have a raffle in order to pay for the machine. And, so, uh, and the business failed. Just by way of saying, we started off having to put together deals that didn't turn out to be great deals in the end. But it got role models going, and pretty soon you had people of quality coming out and saying, I'm not an inventor who doesn't have a management team and so on. I'm an experienced manager, and I want to try and do something significant in this particular sector, which I, which I understand. Now, how quickly that will happen, how many social entrepreneurs are there out there, how many people are motivated as much by helping others as they are to do well for themselves? You know, you can answer that question let me ask you the question. How many do you think? I mean, do you, do you think there are few people who are potentially social entrepreneurs, or do you think there are masses of people, but there hasn't been money for them to take the risk? So I've just been, been in many situations where, like, and maybe it's even been further skewed by coming to a, a business school campus, where people would say, like, my role is on the financing side because that's what I'm good at. And I think it's more a challenge if I don't have that great idea yet. And I think that the world is starved for those ideas. It's not starved for capital, and it's not starved for people that think that a more sustainable lifestyle or a more predictable lifestyle is going to work for like the next great social venture fund. It, it's inherently less risky, um, and I think culturally, I, I think that that is a noble pursuit right now that people see it's in their skill set. I think the, the social entrepreneur taking that responsibility is something that's a little bit outside of a lot of people's comfort zones. We'll have to see. It. My view has been where there is latent demand, if you bring capital, it will express itself clearly. There's huge latent demand in the social sector. Massive, massive shortage of capital. So I have no doubt I'm going to get a ton of people coming out saying, hey, give me money so that I can fund my social organization. That, that's very clear to me. The quality of the people and their ability to scale up and so on and so forth is the issue. But what I see in the recruitment of Bridges Ventures, social finance, and now big society capital is the best of the best are coming to us. The best of the best. The guys who could be at Bain or McKinsey or so on are coming to us and saying, I'll work for you at a 25% discount because I want to be able to talk about what I'm doing. You know? <laughs> beats working for Goldman Sachs and not being able to say it. <laughs> it's just a, a question around metrics. It's one thing to sort of be able to measure widgets that you make for a deal. But, you know, recidivism and, and really someone, you know, they work for a year, but then they go back on unemployment. These are things that are so intractable. How was it going to work? Yeah. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to develop metrics that make sense. In the case of the social impact bond, if uh, they don't offend in the first year, you, you get a payment. They don't offend in the second year, you get an additional payment. You begin to develop structures uh, that give you an incentive to, you know, to keep people um, you know, in jobs. So it, it isn't just a one-time one improvement in, in the statistic. But the issue of metrics is crucially important. 
we're not going to come up with a measure like a social IRR uh, terribly easily down the line. Uh, maybe it'll be the sort of thing we were talking about Washington State, you know, doing. Uh, the relationship between an intervention and, uh, and uh, the cost of an intervention and the cost of a social issue and working out an IRR uh, that way. But metrics is absolutely central to it. And I don't know, there'll be innovation. You know, maybe you know, Bruce and his colleagues will go sector by sector identifying different types of metrics or maybe they'll come up uh, you know, with something that uh, has more general application over time. But you, you need metrics for social impact bonds. That's the thing that could restrict uh, their application. But if you think of recidivism alone, school dropout rates alone, I mean, there you, you've got tens of billions just on those two social issues. And it may be, it, you know, it may be that you begin to, if a, if a school uh, wants to benefit from uh, the efforts of social entrepreneurs to reduce its dropout rate, then maybe it has to keep tabs on where its kids go. And when they move house, it has an obligation to keep tabs on them, just as the portfolio companies of bridges have an obligation to, you know, keep certain metrics themselves. You can game, yeah. You can game. You can game the system. You have to be careful about that. You have to be careful about that too. But that ought to be possible, even if you can't have a statistical control group like uh, you know we have in uh, in the Peterborough case. Um, it it may be that you have an auditing, you know, you have an auditing system. Uh, that makes sure that when you say that uh, these kids have become literate and have passed their exams, they really have passed their exams. And, but it is a challenge. It's, it's something that's going to have to be uh, developed on a on a case by case basis. I take some hope from the fact that the foundations we speak to about this are much closer to the concept of a scorecard. Uh, than, say, the private sector investors would be. Because they're actually giving money away with no performance measures today. And if you think about the social impact bond, by the way, from point of view of a foundation, if it works, you get your money back. If it doesn't work, it was a charitable donation. You didn't, you know, it's no different, actually. But the focus on performance could change the mindset of all foundations about metrics. Because once you begin to invest in social impact bonds, when somebody comes and asks for a grant, you say, well, how are you going to measure your performance? I'll give you a grant, but how are you going to measure the performance? And so this could really be big. This could really be systemic, systemic change. I mean, this, I think it's important for capitalism to evolve if the system is to continue to deliver high growth and risk-taking and all the rest of it, I think it's a crucial part of the architecture that there be a social sector that can deal uh, with social issues. And then I think more broadly, the focus on performance in the charitable sector just hasn't been there with charity. And social investment is, you know, is going to bring it in. So it's like uh, you know, it's like a normal venture capital or private equity. How big, how big is the issue? How effective? Like uh, you know, is this person dealing? I'm take take an example. I mean, uh, you may be you may be dealing with a green issue uh, in a poor area uh, with very limited application. Uh, you know, how much of a benefit are you likely to achieve? A social benefit are you likely to achieve? How big could the organization scale up to be? How good is its management? Especially scale, because what's uh, characterized the social sector is lack of scale. You just can't grow beyond a certain size because you don't dare put on overheads for fear that you won't be able to raise the donations <coughs> to cover them. 
You must be getting pretty exhausted by now. <laughs> What, what states are you, I mean, because even in, in regular venture capital, if you have a great idea, it's very tough to get through the early stages to get funding. So with a social investment, it can be even harder because your, your foundations may prefer investments who are more like proven models, right? So how do you deal yeah. with that issue? So you need, you need entrepreneurs who are credible and who can show that they're achieving milestones. Uh, I think it'll be more lenient. Uh, investment will be more lenient in this area for the simple reason that in the private sector if you were investing a venture capital fund and you made a loss it was a terrible thing from point of view of your return uh, here you make a loss it's a philanthropic donation which you would have made anyway in most cases so the downside for a foundation at least is not is not that great now if you're running a social venture fund and you want to raise more money from your investors next time round to do good things, uh, then you, know, you, you have to take a tougher view. And we've had a situation where we've had to eject the management of a social organization. It wasn't pleasant to do, but the board which that person had appointed decided that the person just couldn't continue to manage it. So would you be willing to go to an unproven model that is very scalable, you think, that nobody has tried before? Yes, definitely, definitely. I'm looking for that. I'm looking for that. We need, new, we need new innovative thinking. We need people to think out of the box and say, you know what, we've focused on dropout rates in this way. It has nothing to do with this. It has to do with parental control and housing. You know? or, you know, when you look at social issues, you begin to realize that they all stem from pretty basic causes. Some stem from mental illness. Some stem from lack of education, you know, undoubtedly. Uh, some stem from broken, uh, broken homes of, you know, of one kind or another. And family histories find, you know, that a, a criminal parent will tend to um, <coughs> educate a criminal child and, and stuff like that. So you have three or four basic causes, and most of the time we're dealing with the symptoms of that, which reflect themselves in crime, in, hopeless, in homelessness, in drug uh, abuse, and in health, uh, and so on. And it's, it's actually amazing when you start quantifying the cost of an issue to see how the victims game the system. So if today you're a homeless person and you want medical treatment, your only chance is to go to the emergency room. So you're constantly going to the emergency room with a huge cost. Now, if, if you provided that homeless person with the care they actually needed on an ongoing basis, it would cost a lot less. And I think, talking about out of the box, there's a guy, I thought the name of the company was the Brown Shoe Company, but I think he's changed the name now. And his marketing thing is for every pair of kids' shoes the mother buys, another pair is given in Africa or in Asia or elsewhere. That becomes a very powerful, very simple, very powerful marketing concept. Could even make money out of make money out of the company, but you know, doing good at the same at the same time. So, you know, in the technology areas, I have a a friend who has developed a credit card size a diagnostic lab. So you can treat for twenty diseases. You take a drop of blood. You put it at uh, the corner of this credit card, and it tests for 20 diseases. You put it on a reader. You can read it remotely, or you can read it, you can read it on the spot. You get somebody imaginative trying to deal with the eradication of certain diseases. Um, you know, doing doing that and doing it properly. You could actually, ch you know, change millions of people's um, lives. And there are, there are, you know, for every one of us in, in this room, there are hundreds out there who are thinking about social issues. I had somebody for, who ran a big chunk of the 
National Health Service come to see me about homelessness. You know, he, had, he was one of the top people in the National Health Service, which employs two million people. He was struck at the terrible way in which homeless people were treated uh, in the emergency room. You know, they were hosed down, they were this, they were that. And, uh, it's something that, you know, speaks to him, and he wants to try to do something about it. Somebody else may, you know, may be attracted to another social issue. And I think what is going to happen, actually, is uh, lifespan gets extended, and people retire earlier, is that there will begin to be a second career in the social area. And if you've been, we've been trying to recruit a finance director for big society capital. We've come across somebody 47 years old, made money in the investment management business, started to work with a charitable organization. It's not there yet. You know, it doesn't see how it's going to scale. So it came to us and said, look, I'll be your finance director. $150,000 a year was, you know, was making a multiple of that before. But it matters to people. And I, I think that's what it's going to come down to. How far is there a latent need of fulfillment in people? Because just doing things for yourself at the end of the day is not entirely fulfilling for most people. A balance between doing things for yourself and doing things for others is. You know, that's the reason you're philanthropic and that's you know, the reason many of you are in this room. You have a desire to help others. So it'll come down to that. And if we've got the spirit of the times right, if what's in the air today is social entrepreneurship as opposed to business entrepreneurship in, in 68 when I was at, uh, at the business school, then this is going to gather pace quickly. And then you know the saying, person who rides on back of tiger can't get off. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs>